Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Core Conversations, ACTC's online series. I am Charlie Thomas, the Executive Director of ACTC. Uh, and whether you are here with us live today or watching this as a recording, uh, we're glad we're glad you found us. Um, it is my pleasure today to uh, hand things over to Michael McShane, which I'll do in just one moment. But first, uh, a few instructions. Uh, Michael's going to give a few brief remarks, uh, reminders of the talk that he uh, that he recorded um, that that I'm sure you guys have already seen, but uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's available on our YouTube channel where this will also be available. Um, so he'll give a brief reminder of that and then we'll just open the floor. Uh, our hour today um, is, is about conversation. Um, everyone's questions, comments uh, are, are welcome. Um, and I will just turn into uh, a kind of traffic cop uh, to, direct, uh, to direct things and make sure that we end on time because that is important. I respect your time and I wanna make sure that, that uh, you are able to not feel awkward about leaving here to get to your other responsibilities. So after Michael uh, makes a few remarks, um, if you would like to ask a question, um, please go down to the bottom of your screen. And I think most versions of, of Zoom now have the raise hand button under reactions. Um, so if you go to reactions, there's a long kind of button at the bottom of that dialog box that says raise hand. Um, and if you click that, it will um, let me know that you'd like to, to get in on the conversation. But please, please do that if you can. But look, if that fails, uh, just wave uh, and, uh, and we'll make sure to get you in there. All right. Uh, it is very much my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Michael McShane to you, who is at the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, uh, an old dear friend who has some really interesting things to say about Dante. So welcome, Michael. Uh, I'll hand things over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, and again, kudos to you for your leadership of the uh, very and increasingly valuable and unique ACTC. Uh, we need this. Thank you for the org service in this regard. Uh, you know, I've always been a big fan and I'm so impressed by what you've been able to do with it in the brief time. Um, thank you also for this introduction and thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, thrilled to be here. I'm hoping to learn some things about Dante uh, from y'all. So um, basically in the presentation that I offered, I made a number of what I call dogmatic claims and um, they basically concerned Cantos uh, 5 and 32 to 33, or the Ugolino story. Uh, and I maintain that in Canto 5, um, it, although it seems on the surface as if Canto 5 is about physical lust, I denied that and said that really Canto 5 is about reading, and in particular, Francesca's desire to be immortalized through becoming the hero of a tragic love story like the other uh, heroine, like the other uh, many people who are mentioned there, um, and about Dante, the pilgrims sort of becoming taken up by her story in a way that's sort of analogous to the way in which she and uh, Paolo, the mysterious silent Paolo, by the way, I renew my request that if anyone has insight into Paolo, uh, I would be delighted to hear about this because I don't understand Paolo very well. I have some ideas. Um, anyway, the two of them become enamored by or sort of I don't know, fascinated by uh, a book and the book is a tragic love story and they, at least Francesca, seems to want to become a part of that book and Dante, the narrator, obliges her. Um, and so the whole thing is about um, is about reading uh, and reading in particular bad poetry and being a bad reader of bad poetry and what it could do to your soul. Uh, so that's the, those are the claims that I made about this uh, in a nutshell. And then um, I took from this the moral of the story or at least a moral of the story being that one is being taught how to read the Inferno uh, in Canto V um, uh, and that the way you must do it is by means of close reading. You cannot accept what it says on the surface. You cannot necessarily accept what the commentators tell you it's about. Uh, you must go deeper. 
and this sets up uh, how to read the entire um, the entire inferno. If you don't go deeper, if you don't read more critically, then you might end up like Paolo and Francesca uh, or Dante the the pilgrim. Similarly, um, uh, I claim that the uh, final canto or the final that final quasi final story, the Ugolino story, is really also about uh, reading or the desire to know uh, and therefore about close reading. But here it's a kind of an infernal version. In the inferno, lots of different, there are lots of different infernal versions of this or that. So there's infernal love, there's infernal reading, there's infernal writing, there's infernal philosophy. There's a, in, I didn't mention this, but uh, in Canto 32, 33, in the Williams story, there's also a, a weird infernal Christianity. Um, and uh, my emphasis on the Ugolino story is that there's an infernal kind of desire to know. It's an infernal philosophy, which implicates close reading and the kind of infernal curiosity that uh, comes from it. And that's why this is at the very end, uh, because one is being sort of taught to be released from that mode and a different mode of reading is required, less suspicious, et cetera, uh, and less grasping in the other two canticles. So that's a brief, I hope, brief privacy of what I tried to do. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the floor is open. Paige. Oh, you're muted, Paige. Right. I got it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, folks. Good Hello. morning. My colleague Michelle in the corner there from Norfolk State and lots of friends. Um, I enjoyed the talk very much, Michael. And Thank you. you sent me immediately to, to Google uh, an etymology for the word highfalutin. That was <laughs> that was my favorite technical term that you used. You. Highfalutin is a good one, and, and and no one can quite pin it down either. I, I got uh, some some people uh, said it had had to do with high flying. And others said it had to do with high fluting, as in flute, flute. And it could be Yiddish for, uh, let's see, uh, nonsense. So <laughs> three different derivations. But I, I like that very much. Um, I, I was uh, also got to thinking about the word ekphrasis. Um, and which I had learned more in the sense of a, a poem, for instance, about a painting, and you were using it a little bit differently. And I thought I, I would ask you to kind of go, go through that thought process again and uh, uh, talk about your use of the term in this context, which is a, a, a more unusual, unusual context. Also, before I stop talking, I want to tell you, I love all your ratio and proportions. Um, I wrote all of those down. Virgil is to Dido as Dante is to Francesca. And then the close reader is to Dante as Ugolino is to Ruggiero. I wrote that all, you know, this is, this is permanent for me. I'm going to keep these next to me. So talk about those things a little bit more. Michael, I'd love to hear some more. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Um, we'd like to mention that if you're interested in high fluting, I've invented my own word, uh, which is low fluting. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, it's the opposite of high fluting. So this is also could be useful if you're if you're inclined to incorporate this into your vocabulary. Um, and that relates to a, a kind of a general point that I am inclined to make about close reading, which is that the register of the language is, uh, this took me a long time to understand, but the register of the language is part of the toolkit that the artist has available to him or her to convey meaning. Um, and it's not, like you might think, oh, it's poetry, so it's supposed to be highfalutin. But then, you know, Dante is more than capable of, you know, being very lowfalutin and saying, oh, they were stuck in the shit or whatever this kind of thing is. So, uh, 
that's that's so this is part of the reason why when you see especially high polluting or you know this is a kind of a deflationary comic word but if you see like elevated diction uh you have to you might you don't have to but you might want to take a step back and go huh i wonder why the author is choosing to write this way in light of the fact that he or she could choose to write otherwise right so this this to me is the key thing for reading is to get puzzled uh about authorial choices like that so that's a quick remark about low and high pollution um another coinage uh, more i guess seriously so the thing about ekphrasis uh is that um yeah so I, I i'm aware that if you look it up you can find lots of different definitions but for me a good functional definition that has been super helpful to me whenever i uh when, when i read um is just art about art right so it could be a poem about a painting right but it could also be i don't know i'm thinking about a place in the mahabharata where there's a very very long description of architecture um and uh just generally anytime you see art about art or you know so we have our you know you might think of like or the creation of art so for example in the odyssey right you have uh scenes in which someone sings a song about the the nostos of the uh the the nostos of the characters so um you know, this is, I would qualify, characterize that as ekphrasis, even though it's not, you know, a different medium, something like that. Why it matters to me is this, that uh, I guardedly said that artists care more about art than almost anything. Uh, and I'm gonna, I guess I'll stick with that qualification, but um, I think that for many artists, art is the most important thing, um, depending how, on how it's understood. And so therefore, uh, this is just a kind of a principle of close reading that when one counters, encounters art about art, which I'm kind of calling ekphrasis, when you encounter it, you should pay uh, very special attention to this because it's likely that the artist is giving you some kind of clue as to how she or he thinks about art uh, and therefore how he or she thinks about his or her own enterprise or how it's being received or how it can be done well or how it can be done poorly. Um, and so the ekphratic nature of the, you know, the repeated ekphratic dimensions of Canto V really stuck, stuck out to me. And so that becomes like, in a way, my major puzzle here, which is why so much ekphrasis in Canto V. And uh, as you saw, that, that was the, the, you saw the answer I, you know, came up with. Anyway. Thank you, Michael. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for that question. Dan. Hi, Michael. Uh, your talk was was great and i have to say i've been looking after that couch you uh, you're sitting on that was in in the video want to know where you got it or will you sell it to me um by the way there's someone uh currently tearing out my bathroom ceiling so you may hear a crash or other sounds it's all with my permission you um it was such a wonderful talk. It drove me to a close reading again. Uh, so shame on you for, for that. Sorry. You didn't say anything, um, as I recall, about the conversation Don between Dante and Virgil in Canto V. And it occurred to me this time for the first time, you know, that there's something really, several things really interesting there. And let me just blurt some things out and ask you to make whatever you might of it um virgil's can name a lot can i ask you to yeah. mention some line numbers oh yeah um so around one one ten one ten to um one twenty thank you good got it and um a, a little bit before that but but Virgil's naming the the souls Dante doesn't doesn't know them and Dante picks out the the two perhaps because the two are are together he also mentions that they're lightweights um, rather than heavyweights which is which is interesting but Virgil says you know 
summon them by the desire. That's how to how to get to them. You know, they'll stop in the name of love. And so Dante gets the uh, the story from Francesca, and there's this interesting uh, moment, and this is at line one. 111, Dante lowers his head in thought and Virgil says, what are you thinking? Que pense, what are you thinking? And there's a pause and I found the pause interesting, uh, almost as though he's, he's holding back. And when he does speak, it, uh, he says, "When I began, this is this is what I said. There may have been there may have been uh, more to to say, but when he turns to Francesca, there is this uh, what you would uh, uh, describe as a blather. You know, your 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 love just your love story just overwhelm me. Blah blah blah. But then he zeroes in on this question, which is put very pithily." How did your love allow you to know your dubious desires? That's kind of clumsy translation of my of my own, but it it really is very pithy and not as florid as some of the translations make it. Um, that's a highly interesting interesting question, but also it, it seems to me, or at least it struck me, it raised a real uh, conundrum that our desires uh, if are suspect by by definition they're uh, they're not to be trusted so where does that leave the desire for knowledge um, seems to be a, a, a crucial conundrum there because the desire to know can also go wrong in all in all sorts of ways. But this brings me back to, to Virgil, who's the master of all who, who know. And um, that's why I, I thought there, there might be more to say about the intermittent dialogue between Dante and, and Virgil in that canto. But, but all of this is just sheer speculation, hunchery on, on my part. I don't have a thought of my own about it. I'd like to know what you think. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, many things come to mind. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is that uh, you know the part, just part of this is that we can see from his answer to the question. You know, first of all, his physical demeanor, bowing his head, holding it out. This is, and of course, this in in the end sort of uh, culminates in the swooning. Um, and alas, you know, I'm not the kind of person who would say this, but you know, there is this discussion of the two of them dying the same death, uh, and uh, this is, um, you know, the, the you might think you might wonder if there's some kind of dirty joke involved in this, right? So this is also a, another funny thing about when when Dante gets all highfalutin, uh, or at least in this one, there are lots of kind of dirty jokes that are hidden in there. So she says, "Oh, we di we died the same death," uh, and then Dante is said to swoon, you know, as if falling dead, right? So one of the things this is something I learned from Simi, uh, my wife Simi Ali. Uh, is that uh, all the characters that Dante meets are Dante. Um, and uh, so here he's identifying so much with them that he's actually dying their death as well from love. So anyway, this is the first moment that we see this kind of the beginning of this progression to his own, to his own death. Um, another comment I would make about this is that it's, you know, note that at least, um, well, he is, in the question he asked to Francesca that you also read, uh, it is actually is kind of, you know, um, highfalutin in the sense that, you know, he, first of all, he's picking up on her personification of love from the, her last speech, 
you know, with the anaphora, you know, all this super literary kind of techniques of like love did this, love did this other thing, love did this other thing. And of course, what it does is suppress any personal responsibility. Like we were just the tools of love. Uh, and love is, at least in the Singleton translation, capitalized, uh, which I think is a good choice, although it's not, you know, capitalized in the Italian, but, but uh, it's as if love is this kind of God that is, you know, that they're in some, in some way worshiping, and um, that makes them very special because love is paying attention to them, etc. So here, he's also personifying love and giving love the agency here. Uh, and so this is to my, in my view, is kind of highfalutin and not, you know, and, and if you, you know, so uh, he says how, I'm just reading Singleton's translation, which I think is adequate. Um, uh, then I turned to them and I began, Francesca, your torment made me weep, uh, your torments make me weep for grief and pity, but tell me in the time of the sweet sighs, right? So he is so caught up, he's enraptured by this, he's in the trance, tell me, uh, or as I call it, the mind lock, by what and how did love grant you to know the dubious desire? So he's picking up on her personification of love. Um, and it is a kind of, uh, I don't to me, this is a sign that he is exactly, as you say, sort of, you know, inquiring minds want to know. He's just, he's caught up in this story, which you can dress up in this very highfalutin language as this wonderful operatic, kind of tragic love story, or you can think, wow, this is some low rent kind of, you know, disgusting story of incest and, you know, murder and, you know, kind of, you, you could write the same thing in a kind of lurid, quasi, uh, I don't know, National Enquiristically, National Enquiristic way. So anyway, these are some, just some observations. I, I don't know if I'm directly uh, responding to your precise question, and if, if you ask again, maybe I would do better. Yeah. No, that was that was great. Could I just throw out one other thing, and then I'll I'll go mute. Um, sure. That famous line that um, the book, the book was the pander, but also the one who wrote it. Yeah. And what does what is that saying about the? author and authorship that goes beyond the effect of the of the book thanks um so uh, uh what i would say about this and of course i'm eager to know what other people think because you know this is how i can actually learn something but um what i would say about this is that this is again evidence that you know this the whole canto is about reading about authorship Right. And here she's blaming again, sort of not the thing that the people in hell don't want to do no matter what is ever, you know, sort of see themselves. They never want to do that. They never want to say, gosh, how did I get myself into this thing? So it was love that did this, or in this case, the book is to blame or the author is to blame these things. So, um, uh, and of course, Galahad is on, um, you know, also a literary illusion, like almost everything else in this story. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's, this is, that's how I see this in, in any case, is that it's more ecrisis, more, you know, gushingly, you know, art being responsible for things, more self, in a way, kind of self, she's praising herself for being so sensitive that she could be, you know, moved by this book in a certain way. So that, that's, uh, and of course, blaming the author, et cetera. And all of this, all of this in the way that I was saying before about Ephesus, all of this is meant to cause you to wonder about the narrator. This gets quite complicated. You have to wonder about the narrator and where he is, Dante the narrator, and then Dante the poet on top of that. Uh, so um, it looks like the narrator is sort of caught in this and uh, I reckon the poet is not caught in this. So, but again, totally interested in other people's comments on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring Brian in here, but let me just say something really quickly that maybe you can deal with later or not, but just as a follow up to Dan's question. I mean, it seems like this question of that I that I love and we talked about after uh, we, you know, stopped the recording, um, Michael was, you know, uh, 
this sort of, this is me, not Michael, my brain works like this. I don't know whether he's does, his does or not, but this sort of two by two grid of good reading of good books, bad reading of bad books, good reading of bad books, bad reading of good books. Um, but if, if bad reading of good books can, can create mind lock, then one can imagine Dante or Virgil, any poet being melancholy about the possibility that they contributed to someone's damnation, which when I see that long pause and the deep sigh, I, I wonder if, if something like that is going on, but I'm not allowed to, to uh, jump the line. So Brian, uh, you're next. <laughs> Brian, you're muted. There we go. So I have a comment uh, and a question. I just finished teaching, uh, or I'm in the middle of teaching Genesis. And so I was struck by two cantos that related to the two trees of Genesis with uh, the desire for, for uh, eating of the tree of life uh, in Canto 5 and the desire of eating from the tree of knowledge uh, of good and evil uh, in, uh, in Cantos 32 and 33. Uh, my, my other thought is that when I read Dante, Dante uh, uh, Augustine is always sitting on my shoulder. And, and both of these um, stories are stories of disordered love. And just wondered if you would uh, perhaps comment or have some reaction to ways that 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 uh, theological idea from Augustine is is shaping what's going on. Good, thank you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, first, thank you for those insights about the tree of knowledge, etc. This is, I think, I'm going to think more about that um, going forward. I think it's exactly a posit. Um, uh, Secondly, with regard to this question of disordered love, yeah, um, so there's actually a place, and I alluded to it in my remarks and could find it um, in a second or two if, if, if it's int of interest, although it's a quite an intricate passage, but it seems to me that there's a place in the Purgatorio, other people probably can find it faster, in which uh, Dante articulates, or sorry, my bad, uh, I guess it's Virgil giving a version of the, it's Virgil giving a version of this, uh, Augustinian idea about disordered love, right? So he actually says in the Purgatorio, Virgil does, oh, listen, you know, what happens with people is that they, it's just, you know, they fall in love with something that is in some way good, um, but they just get it by the wrong handle. Um, and uh, this is really important to me because um, one, and this is likely to be controversial, but I think that Dante is more Socratic. So I don't get me wrong, don't understand Augustine, make no claim to understand Augustine or know anything really about Augustine. I mean, I'm aware of the, of the thing that you just mentioned and it was also in the back of my mind. And I was, I think, uh, but yeah, so I'm not gonna say much about Augustine here, but um, I think that Dante is sort of Socratic in the sense that um, he, he thinks that what causes people to, it seems to me that Dante thinks that what causes people to go wrong is not like knowing that they ought not to do it and doing it anyway, but rather being kind of like in a mind lock, as I called it, or in a trance or sleeping, as he calls it in a certain point, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, that, that good and bad, at least in, to a large degree, is a kind of epistemological problem, like seeing it right. And if you don't see it right, uh, then, you know, like you might think, oh, immortality, great. How does one get immortality? I know one gets immortality by being the heroine of a tragic love story. Uh, and so, you know, the, I think the desire for immortality is good, um, but it's as I think it's, I'm just, I'm quite happy with the language that you propose. It's just disordered um, in her. So completely agree with that. But I also think, you know, a thing I don't understand about Augustine is the, this idea of disordered love on the one hand and the idea of like, you know, you're bad because you want to be bad on the other. But this, somebody maybe later can explain to me how these things fit together. Uh, Sam, Sam Stoner is, yeah, that's right. It's Canto 17 and 18, the Purgatorio. Thank you. Um, uh, that said, can I like to go back to Charlie's question from before, you sneaky, because uh, I think it's really important about, so, 
I think so. Here's a here's a potentially controversial claim. I think if you want to write a book that's going to last forever, you have to write this book in such a way that it will attract the interests of all kinds of different people. And this would include not just people such as ourselves, who are, of course, very sane and you know, sober and good and not neurotic or, you know, have no disordered loves, uh, but also people that are kind of neurotic and messed up in one way or another. Um, uh, you know, they're out there. I don't know if you've noticed this, but so um, if you want to write a book that it can't only be, it can't only attract the attention of sort of merciless close readers and, you know, people that are whatever, so highfalutin like me, college professors or this kind of thing. It also has to, it also has to capture the minds of lots of other different kinds of people. And, you know, um, therefore it's long been my thought that, you know, um, like, you know, think about Canto Five, right? Th there's an ethical problem here, right? And the ethical problem is this, like if you wanna write a book that's gonna last forever, uh, you know, it's gonna have to attract different people in different ways and not all of these ways are gonna be healthy, right? So you said, Charlotte, you said, uh, Charlie, you said, uh, oh, listen, you know, is there, might he have some concern about, you know, helping people to go to hell. And I think this is a very valid concern. I think there's a serious ethical problem in dangling. What Canto Five does is dangles this love story in front of you. Uh, and if you're the sort of person who's inclined to get all oh, swoony, um, it is gonna feed and water that disordered love that you have. Um, even as it more subtly, according to me, undercuts it. Um, and so if you're Dante, you are simply willing to do that. You are simply willing to sacrifice. This is a very sort of hard, hard sort of proposal, but you have to be willing to sacrifice the bad readers, even as you warn them, right? He doesn't come out and say, hey, listen, don't be a bad reader. This is bad reading. Don't do this. He is going to suck you in there. This is his pedagogy. He's going to suck you in. Um, and then at a certain point, if you're careful enough, he's going to reveal you to yourself. And this is what happened to me in Kento's, you know, 33 with the being realized that I was the person stuck in the hunger tower, right? Um, and so that is the most powerful of all kind of pedagogy. However, many, many people, you can be confident that Dante knew very well that many people he would sort of, if they were inclined, they would get stuck. Uh, and he, you know, that is part of his pedagogy is to just get them stuck and then, you know, show them the way out, but not necessarily in a very overt way because the pedagogy is such as to make it you have to figure it out for yourself. And some people who are inclined to this are going to get left there. Uh, and that's the price he's willing to pay. And I think almost all these great authors are willing to pay that price. If you want to do something that's going to last forever, you have to be willing to pay that price. Uh, and so um, I think that there's an, it's writing books like this is ethically uh, hazardous undertaking. What do you think about that? I think I'll put myself on the queue after Sam. Except as host, I can't raise my hand. So you guys just take this as an audible signal that my hand is raised. Uh, Sam, you're up. Thanks, Michael, for um, the interesting paper. I, I, I want to, I have maybe cheat by asking two questions. I just invite you to say a little bit more about your ideas about Paolo. And in particular, I wonder if you have a thought about why he weeps but does not speak. Um, but my real question is sort of a, a follow up to Daniel's question. Um, I take it that a uh, corollary to your principle that poets are always thinking and writing about poetry is that poets are always thinking and writing about poets and what it means to be a poet. Yeah, yeah. And so I want you to say a little bit more about Virgil, in particular, the, the fact that Vir Virgil's one of Virgil's characters, Dido, appears this yeah. canto, and she's the only one of the the souls that Virgil discuss, discusses that he doesn't name. Her name shows up in a Homeric simile a little bit later. And so that's all weird. And I didn't know if, if you had thoughts about what's going on with that, what Dante's doing there. But then the second thing, I mean, it strikes me that when, when Dante the Pilgrim finally does start to talk to Francesca, Virgil's incredibly restrained. I mean, shockingly so compared to his sort of how instructive he is and in a way pedantic he is. I mean, he just says, what are your thoughts? 
And so do you have any thoughts about Virgil's silence during this conversation? Why doesn't he speak up more and prevent Dante the Pilgrim from, you know, getting so involved in the story? Thanks. Okay. Uh, first of all, Sam, it's great to see you. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. Um, it's really, it's a pleasure to see uh, old friends here. Um, and I'm grateful to you for uh, not only coming, but thinking along with me on this. So uh, I'm so grateful to you for asking about Paolo. Um, I, so here are a couple of things you could say. First of all, there are a number of cantos in the Inferno which feature the double and the silent partner, right? So the Ulysses is like that. And even if you think about it, the, uh, the, the Ruggieri um, Ugolino canto, right? So you get like this other person who hangs around, right? Um, uh, in the case of Ulysses' uh, Diomedes, just hangs around, doesn't say a word. Um, and so it seems as if, and I don't know, in my mind, these are three of the most important cantos, the Ulysses canto, uh, the Paolo and Francesca canto and the Ugolino canto um, uh, just hangs around and doesn't say a word. Uh, so it, I, I've long desired to, uh, a kind of a theory or some way of grasping who are these silent, what's up with these silent people that are sort of like connected, but not connect, you know, but don't say a word. Um, and I don't know whether there's going to be one answer for three or something like this. I don't know. Uh, so that's, that's just an opening remark on this question of who is Paolo. So here are a couple of possible, here are a couple of possible um, hypotheses, uh, which I entertain. A hypothesis number one, Paolo is the dupe. And Francesca just needed somebody that would, you know, she's like looking around, I, you know, and people find people who are like, if you are messed up enough that you need to do something, this is, you know, I don't mean you Sam, because you're not messed up, but if one is messed, one in real life is messed up enough that one needs to do something terrible with another person, somehow that other person just is, appears, you know, and is there and can be, or someone is, can be made into this. Why? Because they have some reciprocal thing about them that they are, you know, it's like the shlemiel never appears without the shlemazel. Uh, I don't know if you speak this Yiddish. The, the shlemiel is the person who spills the soup and the shlemazel is the person on whom the soup is spilled. And they're correlative, you know, and they each sort of calls forth the other in some way. In any case, so in, this is in the real world. I've just observed this, you know, that time and again, you know, if somebody needs to do something terrible to someone else, that someone else is going to be found or made. Um, so part of this, it may be that Francesca just needs a dupe uh, that will enable her. She needs like a male that she can, you know, sort of make this story with and manipulate into this. And essentially, you know, I think in my lecture, I said maybe, you know, kill him, assassinate him by means of her husband, who, by the way, is apparently his brother. So that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis uh, is this, that she is an actress uh, and she says the lines and these are lines. I mean, they are not just, nobody talks this way. No one ever talks this way. Only people in books talk the way that she talks, right? So then you wonder, well, who's the writer? And so it may be that she's the actress and he's the writer. Uh, and so, um, and, you know, so his role is to sort of stay, like, stay in the audience and stay off stage and, you know, appreciate her performance, in which case the two of them are sort of in it together, uh, et cetera. Uh, and mm, so that's the, that's another, that's a second hypothesis that I have. Uh, and, but I, since he doesn't speak uh, and is indeed never named, and she never even addresses him, she says this one, right? Uh, it's just, it's very, the evidence is scanty and you need to, I, I'm sure there's an answer to this, uh, Sam, I'm sure there is, but I'm, this is as far as I've been able to get and I don't, if, if you have, a, if you, anyone, you or anyone else has any insight into this or even a piece of evidence that I'm overlooking, please say it now because My, I'm dying to know. Yeah. Just the question, I, I'm similarly perplexed, and especially I always ponder, I mean, why why is Paolo weeping? I mean, what is he, is he weeping in response to the story that he's heard? Is he is he weeping in response to his situation? I mean, the, the weeping is very, it's a puzzling, it's hard to get inside the psychology of the weeping, I, I think. 
the one thing we know for sure about Paolo is that he is in hell. Therefore, he is messed up, right? And he's not like, he's not weeping because he thinks, oh my God, how did I get myself into this? Oh, I feel so terrible. What a fool I was. Because that's not the way they are. If you're like that, you're not in hell. Maybe you're in purgatory, but you're not in hell. So there, he is messed up, right? He's not just the, he, he bought into something he bought into some kind of mind lock, into some sort of fantasy and some sort of trance that he is still in because they're in hell. Um, and so that much I'm confident of, right? So, uh, but beyond that, I'm not sure, you know, so the weeping, I mean, it's just too, it could be that he's faking it. It could be that he's caught up in this. It could be, you know, that he doesn't even know the difference. Like, you know, I don't know. Like, it looks like, it looks like he, at least, pa, at least certainly Paolo is an audience member here. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it may be that, it may be that he's like, um, you know, it may be that his weeping is a lot like Dante's swooning, right? Uh, and, um, you know, if, if you guys aren't especially nice to me, I'm gonna share my screen and put up some scenes from the Paolo and Francesca opera, which is available on YouTube. So you better be good to me because I, I have this power. Um, and, and, you know, you know that the audience is just swooning their heads off there. Uh, so it's possible that he is like the primary audience for her, right? So that's another hypothesis. Uh, but for sure he's in hell and that means that he's unrepentant and that he's deluded. Um, and, you know, whether he's like writing her lines or whether she's writing them or whether he's the dupe, but somehow wants to be, uh, or whether it's the audience, I'm not, not sure. These are the things that come to my mind. Um, does anyone, I know that you asked some other things, but I would yeah. be just selfishly delighted if anybody else wanted to just jump in and educate me or propose I, something about power. I'll, uh, make two quick uh comments slash questions but i do think um depending on how wholly i captivate michael's imagination we probably will have time for at least one more so i hope i hope you'll jump in um two things one uh back to the to the previous conversation which is related to the present conversation we're having about paolo and francesca and reading um and one just about this i guess i'll start with with this the most more recent topic um it seems to me all these things that you and Sam are talking about just underline that this isn't about Paolo. You know, we don't know why he's weeping. And there's several reasons why he could be weeping. Perhaps he's weeping because he attempted to seduce, he was intentional about it, that he was seducing Francesca with the with the romance of Lancelot and Guinevere. And, and it worked. Uh, and here they are. Or perhaps uh, he, perhaps he's, you know, they, they, it was innocent on both sides. They both came to this thing together and were swept away together by it. But in that case, also, he realizes it's not about him. Uh, it, it, I mean, so I wonder if this sort of decentering, as we now say, of, uh, of, of Paolo is, um, is really to emphasize something like your point, Michael, that, that what Francesca's sin is, the way that she's messed up, her mind lock, is not about Paolo. Um, Paolo was a necessary condition for this uh, this this situation she's in, but but not not the key thing. Someone else could have been sitting next to her when they were reading that uh, that romance, and he would have been uh, the the uh, apparent object of her desire in that moment. Although he wouldn't have been that either. Um, so. I, th I think it's I think it's to emphasize it makes sense to me it, it's actually confirmation uh, of your thesis um, on the on the on the earlier thing though on this idea that anybody who writes great poetry is doing something dangerous and that's just cooked in um, that seems really right to me and again it seems to confirm some of the ways that you were talking about why this would be I don't remember your language exact exactly but the first the first sort of canto that follows the, the patterns for the rest, that there's a kind of a preliminary or introductory nature to the first four. So that first functional canto or something like that, I think was your language. Um, so why would this one be first? Um, well, perhaps um, it's, it's first, uh, one of the several reasons it's first 
is uh, that it's a, it's a kind of a, of, a, of a global warning, right? That um, we're doing, I'm doing something dangerous and I know it. Uh, I know I'm doing something dangerous. Yeah. And if you get sucked into any of these um, uh, accounts uh, and I'm going to do my best to suck you into every one of them, uh, you're, you're in trouble. Um, and, uh, and I know it. Uh, a bad reading of any of these cantos uh, could, could, could do you harm. Um, and I know it and I'm doing it anyway. Um, and then one has to kind of think about what that means for Dante the poet and, um, and for the book. But um, that, seems, that seems really right to me. Yeah, I agree. It's dangerous. It's, it's risky business. And it, it fits just to like one more thing since nobody else is jumping in. Please do jump in. Uh, you know, this is this is uh, you know, this is how I think one of the ways one should read uh, you know, the 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 cave in, in the republic too, is that um the, the problem with the images at the bottom of the cave is not necessarily that they um point us away from truth and beauty and goodness. In fact, some of them clearly point us toward it if we have eyes to see. But the danger is that they are so attractive that one, um, in many cases, the good ones in particular, that one can um, get sucked into those rather than, um, than letting them summon you, right? As, and that, that's the, the language of Plato. Um, it's possible for some of them at least to summon you up, but it's inherent in their nature to uh, for there to be a risk of entrapment. Um, and that's just how images work, even the very, very best ones. Ah, this good, Paige. The, it's yeah. the, the, problem of, the problem of mimetic art in general, it seems like, and yeah. the source of the quarrel between the poets and the philosophers. Yeah. And Dante just, seems to be saying it's sort of, it's a necessary thing, like just what Michael's saying. It's, it's, it's inescapable if you're going to do things with images. Um, right. I was just going to remind everybody of the obvious, the, which is my job in life. Uh, remember what he wrote before you go into the inferno, what, that little thing above the door, the, the, the warning. He's warned us, abandon hope, all you who enter here. I, I would, I'm so grateful to you for mentioning that because uh, I, I didn't mention this before, but I think this is um, the first scene of reading in the Inferno, so you'd have to pay special attention to it. Um, and um, I have a couple of comments to make about that. So first of all, it says there, right, abandon hope, all ye who enter. But you could also translate as this as something like, all those who enter abandon hope. And you might also wonder, like, about the authority of that writing, right? So who, who should you believe what it says there, right? And I don't know if you've ever been in an infernal set, sort of corporate set of circumstances where like communications appear that look official uh, and they're of course they're filled with lies. Uh, and one, one, you know, like you could just be like, oh, okay, uh, you know, um, love made this great. Uh, but you might be like, as Dante is, you might be like, huh, I wonder, I don't quite get how this is supposed to work and he may and he starts to ask Virgil a question and Virgil and Virgil is like oh you know I, I Dante's like you know there's something here or not and Virgil just interrupts him and accuses him of cowardice and shoves him on as if so there's a question that is not answered there that Virgil for some reason does not want to countenance um, and I think that question has to do with uh, the fact that some people get out of hell um, and you know there's the harrowing of hell in the Paradiso, right? There's this character Trajan who goes to hell and then, I don't know, a Saint Gregory prays him out of hell, then he converts and is baptized and then goes to heaven, right? So it's not a, you know, it's not an, like you should not, you ought, there is, it's no, it doesn't feel to me as if it's part of Dante's conception of Dante's Christianity that one should ever abandon hope. Uh, and I think that that, thing is a lie and I think that's the first moment of writing and reading that one sees in the inferno and I think that this is a kind of this is also an ekphrasis right 
this is like a scene of a person like somebody carved that on there this is artistic somebody else tries to assimilate it somebody else shoves them along so and and this is another dimension of things so also at the very beginning of canto five uh you know they meet um uh, Midas, uh, who's judging everyone and is said to have the discernment, etc. And that his warning to Dante the Pilgrim is, hey, don't be, be careful who you trust in here. And once again, once again, Virgil just shoves him on and is like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Uh, and I think that this is, so this gets into a kind of complexity about the relationship between Dante and Virgil. That is to say, I think that Dante at this stage excessively idealizes Virgil and that somehow over time, Dante is gonna to have to come to perceive that Virgil also is not uh, perfect. Um, and that while he's good for some things and is really good for Dante at the moment that he meets him, he's also limited. Uh, and you ought not to believe everything he says. For example, um, it's pretty clear that Dante the Pilgrim is told by Virgil, this is, I say, pretty clear because it's passive, the construction, I mean, the, the whatever, the, the meaning is passive. He says, oh, I understood that this was the place where the carnal sinners lived. Um, Intese is the verb, intesi. Uh, I understood that. And it's not clear who it is that provided this information. Um, and this is a very important point to me because I don't think it's about the body at all. Uh, and so this is why all the commentators are all like, oh yeah, this is about the body because it's, this is what Dante says that he understood. But I don't think this is, I don't think Dante understands correctly and I don't think he's being informed correctly. And so uh, in short, um, all the places where information or interpretations are transmitted um, are places where uh, one has to be very careful especially in the inferno because the inferno is a place of lies as Midas himself says like hey be careful who you trust down here because it's this is a place of lies so all right in in, in our final minutes we have two questions uh left so see me and then Dan we'll see if we can get back to you Dan please go ahead see me hi I will just make this very quick because I'm dying to hear Dan's uh question but I just wanted to stress that um this is the inferno, as Michael was just saying, and when we get to Paradiso, our poet tells us explicitly, this is dangerous. Following me here is dangerous. And poetry itself offers images and um, gorgeous language, but um, watch out. And it's a very clear pronouncement of a certain kind of danger that mimetic art has around it. Um, and so it seems to me that any understanding of Dante without entering into that paradisal condition is always incomplete. And I, I, this is just to underscore some other things that have been said, but I just wanted to blurt that out. Yeah, what's not said there is what I believe, namely that Dante is doing it, he is dangling this in front of your worst you know, kind of impulses on purpose in order to elicit them from you. That is not that, I mean, it's, it's kind of vague there, like what is the actual danger? Um, and uh, at least in the Inferno, the danger is that you would buy into their trance or their mind lock. Sorry, uh, next, I'm sorry, I just, I'm trying to. Dan, Dan. Okay, okay I'll, I'll try to make this uh, quick. So I've, I've been turning over in my mind what it means to read this, uh, knowing now that Francesca is such a horrible person and that Rodin statue needs to come down and, uh, and all of that. Um, I had two, uh, I think, contradictory thoughts as you were talking today. today. One is, it, it seems as though in this uh, canto, Francesca's actually seducing Dante. She's playing him oh, yeah. in the way that she plays Paolo. Yeah. You know, he says, I'm I'm overwhelmed by this great, what great desire, uh, yeah. literally. And and she picks up on that. But again, he zeroes in on uh when did you know or um how do you how did how did your your uh passion give you some kind of, of knowledge of your desire. And she says something interesting right after this. This is around uh, line 120. 
she says, but if, if you, here, I'm reading from this uh, translation by Sinclair, if you have such a great desire to know our love's first root, which is uh, literal, then, you know, listen, listen to this. My understanding is the Italian here doesn't, doesn't say anything about his having a desire. It, it just says, if you want to know about the root of this, this is what happened. And, and what she says is that the book, they, they were reading one day, we read one day for pleasure. Sinclair says pastime, but it's, it's diletto, delight, pleasure. And, and all of that. We were alone and had no misgiving, uh, Sinclair says, but, but it seems to be we had no suspicion. Suspetto, uh, sans alcun uh, suspetto. We had no forewarning. So it looks indeed as though they were, um, you know, innocent victims overcome by, by, uh, by this force. And, and your point is don't fall for that, you know, that's gonna drive you into the YouTube opera and, and so on. But it does seem to be um, emphasized in, in this passage that that indeed is what happened, that that is the root. So if, if the root isn't accidental, then are, are you saying that the root is this other thing, this, this uh, intellectual deformation, uh, the mind gone wrong, but it seems to me that that still remains really mysterious. You know, if- I, if I the, am um, I'm yeah, dispositionally sorry. incapable of cutting this off. Uh, so it is 11 and if you need to leave, please leave without a second thought, but I will keep this going for five minutes um, so that we can get some response to this fabulous question. Yeah. And I apologize. I know there's not a there's not a clear question in in there. As I said, this this just struck me as you were speaking. I guess I'm maybe I'm I'm asking. Does this canto give us uh, an insight into that broader, more serious uh, deformation of of intellect that you've been talking about, or do you only see that retrospectively? when you work through the whole the whole thing um so it's kind of a matter as it seems to me it's kind of a matter of just putting together all the different pieces and asking uh and getting appropriately puzzled and then trying to figure out what the best explanation is so to me the fact that there are so many references to poetry to poetic heroes uh from the past uh there's so much use of poetic diction and poetic, you know, techniques, you know, uh, anaphora, you know, you got to look this stuff up, like, you know, all, all of these personification, uh, ekphrasis, as I mentioned before, um, so much, uh, you know, all the Homeric similes and all the rest, right, it becomes, to me, this is, so my proposal is that this thing is really about literature and literary desires both to have you know for the tragic you know love story and the swooning and the sort of a desire to feel like oh life is meaningful in this particular way and for Francesca that she can achieve this immortality uh by means of being written about by a poet and this is why she's so glad to see Dante um and uh as Virgil predicts um and um this is why like if you count the reference like even just the words speaking and telling, telling, speaking and telling, just show up so many times. Oh, I'll be glad to tell you, tell, tell, tell me, tell me. You know, this is, you, you can just count how many times this shows up. So it's all about, so in, in my interpretation, if you put together all of these things, what you can discover is that what is drive the precise thing that is dri driving you crazy is a desire to be like the, you know, Helen or, you know, uh, Paris or Tristan or, you know, all these people about whom these operas are made. Uh, and, um, you know, to be the famous heroine of a tragic love story. And if you, if you put plug Paolo and Francesca in there, it turns out there are, you know, there's a dozen operas about this, right? So to me, the great irony is that she got what she wanted. Um, that is to say, Dante 
the narrator did make her into a famous heroine of a tragic love story. And if you watch some scenes from this opera, you're like, oh my God, I mean, I'm supposed to swoon now. This is, you know, like I'm not a, the swooning type, or at least if I am, I try to hide it. So, uh, you know, so she got what she wanted, except that she doesn't understand. And I think few people do. Uh, like, I think all the people who made, well, this is an exaggeration, I don't really know, but my, I'm inclined to think that the people who made art about, you know, Paolo and Francesca, all these operas, et cetera, they are, they got taken by this and the same people in the same way that the people who go to the operas are getting taken by this. Um, and again, this is unwarranted, unevidenced claim, but just an intuition. Um, but yeah, so she got what she wanted, but she failed to understand, the narrator gave her what she wanted, but the poet twisted it in such a way that, you know, it can be seen that she is, that this is a terrible mistake and that she, you know, drove herself crazy and killed her husband and, uh, sorry, mm, drove her husband crazy and sent him to hell. And, you know, of course he's responsible too. And Paolo and, you know, got, you know, all this terrible, terrible stuff came out of this desire for her. So that's my, that's my claim. And otherwise, um, you know, so the, the puzzle is how to account for all of the insistent cloying literary references which become bad writing here. And uh, the first thing, the problem is to even notice, oh wait, this is actually is sort of bad writing. So in short, I think that the narrator does one thing uh, and the poet does another. And, you know, the narrator gives her what she wants and the poet ironizes her. This is my suggestion. And I, I, that has to be our last word. Um... I love that we're running up against this constraint because it's just evidence as if we needed any more that this was a great conversation. So please uh, join me in uh, thanking Michael. And uh, please think about coming back. Our next core conversation will be with Christine Dunn Henderson on Tocqueville. That uh, video, will, video will go up soon. We've got a really fantastic series um, this year and you can uh, see more about it on the website and through my emails, et cetera. Great to see everybody. Thanks for coming.